All right, we see more. Welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Megan will continue to monitor the waiting room. Uh, thank you all for coming. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, thanks Sue for nodding. Well, welcome again. Um, this is, my name is Carol Lavoie Schuster. I'm the Vice President for Grants, Nonprofit and Donor Services here at ECCF. Um, we're excited to have this Lunch and Learn focused on basic needs. These are really sessions that emerged out of COVID. Um, we used to host probably three to four times a year Lunch and Learns where we would bring busloads of donors, institutional funders, and other stakeholders to different communities. And of course, naturally we had to pause that during COVID. Um, my team and I, in the early days of COVID, uh, through all of the work in partnership with many of the folks on the call here and the 4,000 plus nonprofits in the county, we were in constant communication, having these really authentic conversations around what was really happening in real time in the community. and. We were hearing from fund holders and other donors that they were missing those authentic connections and conversations. And so we started these Lunch and Learns as a pilot. They are virtual. They're also sort of an opportunity, as I said, to hear a little bit about the different organizations by category, but also really that unvarnished view um, of our partners that are on the, on the ground doing work seeing what's happening in their sector, but also what their hopes and dreams are or opportunities for deeper investment um, as we look at the whole ecosystem of the social sector and the ways that we can have the greatest impact. So today's session, um, we do these every other month. Uh, at the end of the session, I'll talk a little bit about the upcoming sessions. We do record these sessions. We will share out um, the things that we learned after today's session but we wanna sort of just jump right into the dialogue. So we're gonna hear from four of our community partners who are working in this space. They'll each give about a 10 minute presentation talking about their background, their organization, how things have changed during COVID, even organizationally, but again, in the whole ecosystem of the work that we do. And then where are some of the opportunities that they see on the horizon? Um, so first, we're going to hear from Lindsay Haight, the executive director at Our Neighbors Table, followed by Sue Gabriel, the executive director at Beverly Bootstraps, Carmen Vega, the shelter manager at Lazarus House, and Russ Poulin, the director of family services at Lynn Shelter Association. So we're going to turn things over to Lindsay, who's going to kick things off for us. And after each of the presenters share a little bit more about the questions that I just posed, we'll have an opportunity for about a half an hour to have a dialogue and have questions. So please keep track of your questions and I'll be facilitating the conversation. Lindsay, we'll turn things over to you. Megan will bring up your deck. Um, Carol, can you just make me co-host? Yes. Uh, I'll just jump right in while we're pulling up the slides here. Uh, thanks so much, Carol and ECCF for inviting our neighbors table to participate in this conversation. Uh, I agree, one of the greatest impacts of COVID on our work has been uh, just the challenges it presents for our ability to stay connected with our community, whether uh, it's a community member who's in need of our services or a community member who wants to engage in our mission. And uh, <laughs> I think we've all been flexing our creative muscles uh, more than we ever imagined to try to figure this out. I personally do not have any kind of degree or training in digital anything. <laughs> it's probably my greatest weakness, but um, you know, I think we're all grateful for platforms like Zoom and, and others that allow us to be able to connect. So thank you to everybody who, who came on today. Uh, as, as the organization in the group that is solely focused on food, we thought I'd kick it off um, and then um, my peers, my colleagues can sort of speak from 
kind of a broader lens in, in various aspects. But um, so a little bit about our neighbor's table. We are based in Amesbury. We've been around, we've been at this work since 1992. Uh, and, you know, we have kind of that traditional uh, food pantry meal program history. We were, a, you know, a local group of citizens who wanted to help their neighbors out and thought what's what's the best way we can as ordinary citizens. So what started with um, a weekly community meal eventually over the years uh, grew and uh, evolved to include a traditional food pantry. And then in 2016, um, uh, we kind of threw the traditional model out the window and uh, really focused on what we needed, what our guests needed to sustain food access. And uh, so in 2008, we declared the, the service region um, that you see on that slide there, that map. So we cover 12 cities and towns in Northeastern Essex County through our grocery programs and our SNAP outreach. Uh, our community meal continues to be open to anyone and everyone who uh, who finds themselves uh, in need of a dinner on a Wednesday night. Uh, so um, it was actually back in 2019. I know I saw uh, Joyce uh, here from the Cummings Foundation in 2019 uh, with the sustaining grant program as the catalyst. We set our sights on creating a food secure region by 2029. Uh, that was not a, a goal set in a vacuum. Uh, in fact, in 2018, we declared the city of Amesbury our first food secure community. Uh, and after understanding all of the different elements that went into uh, getting to that milestone, believed that with, with the right investments and the right strategy, there was no reason why we couldn't provide universal food access in all 12 cities and towns uh, within 10 years uh, for certain. Uh, if you could go ahead and jump to the, to the next slide. Uh, so we, um, this, this slide might appear to be a little bit elementary. I imagine those of you on the call have spent some time in the food security space before. Um, but we believe that there's a really important distinction that needs to be made between hunger and hunger free and food insecure and food secure. Uh, and, and our goal is not to just make sure that people are eating today, but to actually achieve food security by ensuring that we have sustained consistent access to adequate nutritious food for all residents. Uh, and it took us about five years before we were ready to declare the city of Amesbury food secure. Um, and it was watching and monitoring the sustained service provision, but also the community engagement uh, in breaking down stigma, uh, allowing people to access the help they needed when they needed it uh, in a dignified manner without shame, without judgment. Uh, so that, you know, whether we're in a booming economy like we were in 2018, uh, despite uh, food insecurity in our communities still on the rise, uh, or we're in a global pandemic like we were in 2020, people are accessing food. And in the height of the pandemic, in the summer of 2020, the city of Amesbury actually put out a return to school survey uh, and got really strong response from uh, families with school-aged children fewer than 6% of families reported food as a concern. Uh, when, when those rates of family food insecurity in the pandemic were 15 to 20% across the Commonwealth and across the country for the city of Amesbury to show less than 6% of families were concerned about food access, told us that the network of food access points as well as the leverage of school meals, SNAP, uh, and, and the awareness and breaking down stigma and support from the community at large was really sustaining um, that food security level uh, through, through a global pandemic. Uh, and so we're really looking at, um, if you wanna go ahead to the next slide, um, just a little bit about what we were able to do during COVID. Uh, in response to COVID, this was not something we were planning to do before, uh, but we were able to launch within uh, just two weeks of the shutdown uh, by the first week of April, we launched an online shopping platform. So, um, 
so our neighbor's table provides uh, food security to our communities through grocery distribution, a community meal, SNAP outreach, uh, and uh, coordination of a broad collective of food service providers as well as cross-sector partners. Uh, and so in our food distribution part during COVID, uh, we launched this online shopping platform, which required a whole lot of behind the scenes work uh, for live inventory. Uh, and so guests were able to continue to shop for their groceries, just like they were coming in person. That is a huge piece of our model. We believe people have the power to decide uh, what they eat. Uh, and we just make sure that we put their, their most needed items uh, on the shelf and make them available to them. Uh, so we never prepack bags. We believe that's actually contributing to food waste uh, and disempowerment of people who are experiencing food insecurity. So we launched this online system uh, to date since launching that in April of 2020, we have processed more than 50,000 orders. Uh, we've distributed 2 million pounds of groceries uh, and we've served about 5,600 people living across our service region. Uh, that's in addition to the uh, three to 400 people who are ac accessing our community meal every week, uh, which is a, a, a triple of pre-pandemic levels. Um, but we're finding that curbside and takeout models are actually opening the doors for families who are living, uh, living on the edge before, but maybe our programs were less accessible to them. Uh, so in our region, the number of food insecure individuals before COVID was around 6,000. Uh, and since the number has now increased to 10,000. To be honest, I'm not sure that I believe, actually, Megan, could you jump to the next slide? Um, we have historically served, uh, and go ahead and click, you can show the next um, animation piece come up here. Uh, we have been consistently serving more than what the data tells us is food insecure in our region. And I think truthfully, uh, the numbers that the data shows us now align more with the number of people we have been uh, have been serving or our partners have been serving. I think that the data metrics uh, the captured more people because of the pandemic. Certain things like unemployment or utilization of services perhaps are revealing people that were living under the radar and not captured in traditional data metrics before. So this is just a snapshot of how the trend in our region has, has projected over time, uh, going back to 2014 when this data was made readily available to us by the Greater Boston Food Bank and Feeding America. Um, and so despite a booming economy, you can see that food insecurity uh, was still in, on the rise in 2016. It leveled out a bit in 2018, again, according to the data, we were still serving more people than ever in 2018. Um, and then we saw the spike in 2020. Um, so you see a few different metrics on this map uh, that we are following as, as we think about the need and how people are leveraging local resources as well as federal and state funded programs. Um, so we are following SNAP eligibility uh, as well as SNAP enrollment um, and trying to close in that SNAP gap. Uh, and then looking at those who are who are estimated to be food insecure based on Feeding America's um, measurements and how many people we're serving. So you can see in 2018, we had come really close to closing the gap uh, and closing in on the number of food insecure individuals and somebody moved the goalpost for us. Um, but we do believe that food, in, food security is still absolutely possible. Uh, go ahead and jump to the next slide, Megan. Um, I think what we what we have learned uh, or has been reinforced for us, uh, which goes back to the very founding days of our mission, was the strength of the collective process. And that no one individual, no one organization can solve food insecurity uh, or provide universal food access to all residents. It really takes a collective approach. Uh, so for 10 years, we've been convening the local network of agencies that provide food services, um, and the pandemic really just strengthened our resolve to work more, you know, more deeply than just basic coordination and relationship building, but real collective uh, strategy. Uh, but the other important piece is that uh, those who are experiencing food insecurity 
don't start in our network, they come to our network from other places. And so whether it's through um, their neighbors uh, or it's through cross-sector partnerships, uh, we for the last four years have been concentrating on building awareness. Uh, we have a food security advisor group made up of all of our town managers and mayors, all five of our school superintendents, uh, our community hospital, Anna Jakes, the largest pediatric practice in the region, children's healthcare, uh, so that they can help to identify and catch uh, people who are experiencing food insecurity, but also to create a culture of acceptance so that people can be safely referred and will access programs that are built with, with their needs in mind. Uh, we can't do this without infrastructure. I think what COVID showed us is this ad hoc charitable emergency food system is insufficient to meet our needs. Uh, and so we have really been focusing really over the last five years on building infrastructure uh, and since COVID really focusing on leveraging our expertise and resources to build infrastructure for our entire network. So we look forward to some um, more conversations about what that will look like in the year ahead um, and uh, really making sure that we have food access points throughout our region, no matter which zip code you live in. Um, and you know whatever might be the presenting barrier to food access. So uh, that's a really quick overview of what we do. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over, but look forward to further conversation later in the call. Terrific, thanks, Lindsay. Um, and I, you know, we, Lindsay and I have lot, had lots of conversations around this collective approach. And so I hope there's, an opportunity, right? We all wanna have the conversation around funding individual organizations and the importance of that, but then the whole ecosystem. So I hope that during the uh, Q and A that there's lots of conversations around how to, you know, work with funders to clarify the messaging of the importance of that work. So with that, I'm gonna move things along to Sue, Sue Gabriel from Beverly Bootstraps. Thank you for having me. Megan, I'm going to try to drive myself if I can. Do I have sharing permission? Great. You, sh you should. Yep. Great. Let's see if it works. Can you see that? Great. Fantastic. I love it when something works. Let's see if I can get it full screen. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everybody at ECCF, uh, especially Carol and Megan for putting this together. We, um, we always appreciate the opportunity to chat with folks about the work that we do. And um, it's been quite a ride, I have to say, the last number of months. Uh, I, we, we do a lot of planning around here and we have some emergency plans in place, but never did we think of a pandemic. So, <laughs> but let me start uh, with a little bit of background on, on how things are sort of typically for us. So this is our mission statement. And, um, you know, we're all about helping people when they have basic needs issues, and then hopefully trying to get them on a path towards stability and with any luck, self-sufficiency. And we are pretty much completely uh, funded by the community. So we really appreciate the community's support. This is our tagline um, because we really believe the first thing we have to do is embrace someone, whether it's a, a, a donor, a volunteer, or our clients, or our shoppers. We need to embrace them first then let them know all the things and the ways that they can help or we can help them, and then empower them to actually act on that. This is our building that we've been in for about five and a half years. It was uh, quite an undertaking, but we really needed the space and uh, we are very, very grateful to be in it. So for us, when we look at food insecurity, we know that it's a, it's a symptom. Um, you know, somebody, if someone's hungry and they can't pay for their groceries, it's because somehow, some way their budget is not working. So we made this slide years and years ago, but uh, you know, this is, Hunger comes from lots of different places and it's not the same for everyone. So one of the first things that we wanna do is obviously address that hunger. We need to get them some food. But then if we can have a conversation with them about what's driving that, that budget issue, you know, is it the cost of housing? Is it that they have some unusual medical costs going on? 
Is it that they're underemployed or they're not employed at all? Is it that they've been in generational poverty and they really have no idea how to work their way through and out of it? Um, there's so many reasons that someone can have that economic insecurity that drives them in to chat with us um, about, can I get some food or can I meet with a case manager to talk about some of the things that are going on? So way back, uh, we were almost 30 years old um, and way back at the very beginning when we were being born in the basement of a church, there was a recognition that we needed to have some case management and education and some services around uh, those folks that were seeking that kind of help. Uh, this is a slide that we use to try to explain how we think about our programming. Um, for us, access is the number one key issue. If someone cannot access our programs, then we can't help them. So we really look at all of our programming around access and making sure that people can actually uh, partake. Um, if they can access it, then our hope is, and our wish is that we can get them to a place of stability. And that means that somehow they have a plan that whether it's they come to us every couple of weeks for food or every week for food um, or whatever that plan is that, that you know they, they are working with the utility company, they're now on a payment plan, whatever, the, whatever it is that we can do for them so that they can get to this place of stability. That's our first goal. Because if they can't get to stability, then they can't even think about that sustainability or in some cases, and we hope in, in more cases than not, a long-term sustainability or even self-sufficiency. Um, and we're fine once they get to that sustainability point, again, no matter how they're putting it all together, that's just fine with us um, as long as they really find that, that sustainability. But if they can get to self-sufficiency, that's just, that's the bonus. And we do have clients that uh, go through some of our education programs and they actually do manage to get into that self-sufficiency box. We've actually had some that have become donors, which is wonderful. That's the ideal. So how do we do this? How do we help? Uh, we have all of these different sort of buckets of uh, programming. And uh, so I'm going to go through it very quickly, but I recommend if you want to know more and know some of the statistics about our programs, you can go right on our website, beverlybootstraps.org. We have um, all kinds of stats there if you'd like to look at them. So our food assistance is certainly a food pantry. We started as a food pantry. We are still running our food pantry. Um, but we realized that that doesn't provide enough access to food for folks. So we also, also work with the local schools on a Kids Eat Healthy initiative, uh, weekend bags and snack programs, things like that. We run a mobile market and we run a se senior mobile market when we can. Uh, we are, assist the community in the community meals program. Um, and newly uh, during COVID, we actually did some um, pretty remarkable delivery to our seniors who were very hesitant to come and rightfully so very hesitant to come out to our food pantry. In our adult education space, uh, we, we run a high set test preparation to get people so that they can take the high school equivalency exam, which is high set right now. That's the company that, um, that runs that testing process. Um, if they achieve all five tests, they end up with what is the equivalent of a high school diploma, and that helps them then get on to the next step, whatever that may be. Uh, we run English language classes because that it can be a, an enormous barrier for somebody to become stabilized or self-sufficient eventually. Uh, so we do run those classes. And then we have sort of this bridge college and career readiness that we try to help folks then from that success in high set or English language onto that next step of, of how could they go into a certificate program or maybe even college. Um, we've had people who have gotten their MBA coming out of our programs, which is really amazing. Our client support is, um, it, it's all kinds of basic needs around housing stability and, you know, we can help with SNAP applications and any, any, anything to help them connect with basic needs, maybe even on a federal level. Um, you know, any, any of the programs that they can access, the case managers can sit and work with folks. Um, and then we run a free tax preparation program during tax season for, you have to qualify, you must be low income. But in that way, we can return so much money back to our clients 
I think last year it was over $600,000 that we were able to return back to clients with, especially with the childcare credits. It was really amazing. Um, we didn't spend a lot of money to run the program. We have some amazing volunteers, but we, we were able to return a lot back to our clients. And then we usually try to have an action plan um, with our, our clients so that they know what the next steps are and our, our case managers work with them to get through that action plan. Our youth and family, we do a lot of seasonal programming. We call them budget busters. So if, if your family is really on the edge and then all of a sudden the holidays come around and you're, um, you know, you just can't stand to see your kids not have those holiday gifts, that is a huge budget buster for you. So we have a program called Adopt a Family. We're right in the middle of it. We do back to school uh, supplies right before school. Cause again, really expensive to outfit the kids with those, um, those, those need, very needed school supplies. Uh, we do help kids get into summer camp, uh, knowing that particularly for some kids that are in generational poverty, if they can have a different experience, they can potentially decide that maybe a different path is um, something they can envision. And then I think I already mentioned, we do a, the, the Kids Eat Healthy program. Our thrift shop uh, is, is not only a revenue generator for us, but it is also a program in that anyone in the community can go in and get uh, low cost, gently used items at, at less of a cost than if they shopped into, in regular uh, retail. We can also write vouchers out to folks who need either clothing or household goods. And it is a wonderful place for anybody to donate and we keep things out of the landfill. But if you are planning to donate, we hope that it is gently used and something that you would give off to your sister or your neighbor or your best friend. So how about COVID-19? Uh, well, you know, it definitely shook up our world. There's no question about it. Uh, our thrift shop was closed for three months. Um, we had a lot of things that happened, but I'm going to sort of talk about what we saw for impacts for our clients first, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how it impacted the agency. So for somebody who was a head of household, what we were seeing is that, you know, maybe they were laid off or they're, they're, they had a cut in hours. Um, we had a few people come in on Christmas Eve last year or the day before and they were in the restaurant industry and they had just been fully laid off and it was you know, quite a shock to them. Uh, so we saw that you know, quite a bit. Um, maybe they had to quit because they had no childcare options. That was a really uh, unfortunate outcome um, without school in session consistently. Um, the impact to employment was really um, pretty stark for a lot, of, a lot of families, but particularly those that did not have uh, a white collar job um, they couldn't just have the kids in another room studying. They had to be home with them. We had many clients who were actually quite well supported by either unemployment or the COVID relief money, um, and, and they didn't need us all that much. Um, but then we had others who were fearful of trying to access that government assistance. And so they were pretty vulnerable, and we were seeing them. And I know from my colleagues that in other communities, um, they were they were really seeing a lot of folks that did not want to uh, try to get SNAP benefits or uh, some of the other government assistance and their numbers were really, really, um, really unbelievably impacted. They were, it was amazing what they were doing. Uh, we, had, we had a number of households that were sick with COVID and we actually started home delivery to households that had COVID. Um, and we saw a lot that people were worried about their housing, even though there was a moratorium um, there were still some real concerns that, uh, you know, they were getting behind on their, their rent or their, even their mortgage. Um, we had people who at the time of COVID were doubled up or tripled up, which means they're on somebody's couch or there. And that was, those, those were some really tricky situations where people were, um, crowded in together. And obviously from a health perspective, that was, uh, not, not a fabulous situation. Uh, so for our kids. One of the first things that happened was, uh, I remember one of those very first weeks I was on a call with uh, a number of folks from the community because there was a, a very justified fear that the kids would not have access to, to food if the schools were shut down. And so I think that was probably the biggest thing that we saw initially 
uh, we worked really closely with a lot of the local folks and um, got that squared away and uh, between us all, because Lindsay, your point was um, so well taken that it really has to be a full community effort. Um, and you know, we found out that the schools were willing to step up to take the majority of that, which was great. We filled in where we could and uh, the, the kids uh, were well supported in that way. But we were seeing that there was a real vulnerability for the kids. Um, you know, we're, we're not the only ones to see this and, and talk about it, but um, certainly I think we were all worried about their health and still are, although the, you know, more vaccines are becoming um, available, which is great. For the kids when they were home, that social isolation was not good for them. Uh, and I think, you know, we were seeing a lot of families that were reporting more mental health issues than ever. It's always a piece of the puzzle or seems to be frequently a piece of the puzzle, but we were hearing about it more and more and more. And we were hearing more about kids. Uh, and because I know so many people in the community, I just heard that, you know, the hospital had to set up almost like a triage in their, in their conference room because they didn't have enough beds or spaces or, or ways to really support the, uh, the mental health needs of the kids. Our seniors, wow, you know, this was a group, of course, really, really impacted. Um, they were so vulnerable from a health perspective, um, but also sort of economically, um, those that were just sort of teetering on the edge. I think this was a, a place where um, they, they were more vulnerable in that respect because we had a lot of folks that couldn't afford to do something like an Instacart or a, you know, um, a, a virtual shopping because they couldn't afford it. Um, where, you know, whereas that was a way for a lot of seniors to solve it, there were a lot that couldn't solve it that way. So uh, we ended up starting to do senior delivery out to um, many of the senior housing complexes because we just knew even if they could afford it, afford to grocery shop, typically um, this time period, they might really struggle with access to food. Um, and medications were a big thing too. We really didn't play a part in that, but certainly we, we knew that they were having some challenges um, accessing medication at that time too. And then for them, you know, I, we've all heard about it, but we, we could see it even when we were delivering, you know, that isolation and their mental health, it was really tough. You know, we would go into buildings and they'd have the, the common room all shut off and closed off and you know, so, for, so for so many of those seniors, that was a really tough time. So for us um, at our agency, um, you know, we had our thrift shop cut, uh, closed down for three months, certainly impacted our income. Um, fortunately, we did apply and got a PPP grant. Um, that was a game changer for us. Um, the community luckily um, really came to our aid and supported. Um, we had to send all our volunteers home. So we had no volunteers in our building for 15 months. Um, we did um, do a lot of the food distribution. I've kind of um, chatted about it. We had to move our food pantry model from a full choice into um, packed bags to just get people in and out very quickly. We did the senior delivery. Um, amazingly, we got to the end of it all. And in FY21, we just we couldn't believe that we had served um, over half a million pounds went out between all of our food food programs. Um, we shut down our adult education classes immediately. Uh, we were down for about three months and then we brought them back virtually. Um, we've had mixed results. We, um, unfortunately, our tax prep program, we were right in the middle of it and we just had, it just, it stopped because the IRS was unable to do anything virtually and it was too dangerous to bring people into the building. Um, our 21 tax prep was fully virtual. Uh, we had people come in, we just scan their, their tax returns and then um, somebody would prepare it and get back to them. Um, we're hoping to go hybrid this year, we'll see. Uh, our seasonal programs um, really all happened from the parking lot. We had donors drive up, we took things from their trunk. We had our clients drive up and we put things in their trunk. So we were just um, um, a big parking lot <laughs> transaction is what was going on. Um, and very recently, um, you know, unfortunately, we're not alone in this, I know, but we have had quite a bit of staff turnover. And I, I really do believe the stress of the pandemic has been um, a really big contributor to it. We've had people front facing um, for you know, the entirety of it. And it definitely takes, it to takes its toll on our, our folks, um, but we'll, we'll get through it. We'll have great new people that will come in, but um, just in this moment, it is a little challenging. 
So, but there were, you know, always something big like this does create opportunities. Um, so some of the things we found out was, you know, there were, we have our high set program is going incredibly well. We have clients who love it. Our ESOL, not so easy and not so well, as you can well imagine with that language barrier. Um, it can be a little bit challenging, um, but we see that we will probably continue to keep a piece of virtual in our programming model um, because there's some, been some really great things. Um, remote case management has not been ideal, but we have made it work. Our clients are still getting um, served. We can't wait to get them back in person um, more full time. It's, it's definitely a better way to do it, but we made it work. Same, with, same thing with our tax preparation, better in person, but we can work it remotely if we need to. Um, and we just realized college and career readiness will be a big growth area for us because as people are making all these uh, changes in their world, if we can support them with that, that will be a good thing. Um, it's really interesting to have watched all of the support from the government programs. And um, you know, it's, they're efficient, they're effective, they're standardized, and they really have stabilized so many of the people we work with. It's been a good thing. Uh, so we'll see where they go, but, um, but, but I just, from watching our client, for our clients, it's been very good. So there are definitely though some gaps and some systemic issues that we've noticed. And uh, the first one is affordable housing. There's just not enough of it. We knew this before the pandemic, but you know, going through the pandemic, we've just seen the, the need for uh, affordable housing is just so great. And um, you know, I'm gonna let you go ahead and click on some of these links at, at, at your le leisure, but um, there's some really, um, really um, startling, I guess, if, if you haven't been exposed to it yet, some really startling uh, stats and you know, how expensive we are here and how we just don't have enough affordable housing. Um, the other thing is, you know, the 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 importance of childcare. We just could see as as things uh, changed with the pandemic, and that childcare was not available to a lot of people. That was such a critical thing for their employment and their household well-being. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the and the cost of childcare is just crazy. So that's another another thing that we see often is a real challenge for our families. Um, you know, and, and I think even all of us can relate to that. And then finally, um, mental health. You know, really, we just saw a lot of it uh, during the pandemic and worse. And uh, went through it as quick as I could, and I will pass it on over. Sue, so that was awesome. That was such a, a great wealth of information. And we'll be sure to share out all those links and, you know, yet again, this illustrates um, really when you're talking about all of our collective work, you can't talk about one piece of the pie, right? You're talking about food, housing, mental health, childcare. Um, it, again, it illustrates sort of the importance of looking at the entire ecosystem. Yes, recognizing the aspects of each unique community, each unique organization, um, but also simultaneously looking at the whole ecosystem. So that was a great um, additional, as was Lindsay's uh, illustration of the importance of that. Um, so why don't we move along and welcome Carmen Vega. I'll let Carmen share. Um, and I'll also add too, uh, this is a new role for Carmen, super exciting. I've known Carmen a long time. I've known all these folks a long time, but. Carmen, I had the pleasure of working with very deeply uh, during Columbia Gas. She was one of our amazing social workers um, and was impacted by Columbia Gas herself and her family. She's an amazing story, but we're delighted she's in this new role at Lazarus House. And um, so we'll go ahead and turn things over to her. Thank you so much. Um, and Megan will be sharing. Okay, so my name is Carmen Vega. Do you hear me? You hear me? Um, and I've lived in Lawrence my whole life, and this is my community. And I'm very blessed to be on this side um, and be able to share like the need of my community. So Lazarus House has been in the community since the early 1980s, and we provide shelter, transitional housing. Um, let me move this 
food, clothing, and advocacy. Um, we start, like we treat our we treat them and we call them guests. Everyone that comes in our doors or on a phone, we we call them they're our guests, and we treat everyone with dignity and respect. Okay, yeah. the next one. So prior to COVID, we used to be able to house up to about 40 people. This is the, the first picture that you're seeing is the original Lazarus house. Everything was run out of here. It was the food pantry, um, the shelter, which house I believe was five beds and the admin, this was the admin building, everything. And um, so this is where it first started. So prior, um, then we were able to house single men up to like nine to 10, single women up to like four. And then we were able to house about eight families. Then due to pandemic, right, we ended up having to close the shelter, unfortunately, because my staff, like staff stopped coming in. Like they were like, they were so scared, right? We didn't know what was going on. They were so scared and we just did not have enough you know staff to run the shelter so we did end up closing for a little bit we did um put our guests in a hotel uh, for some time up until and, and up and then we reopened back in october we that's when we had our open house we opened again but those families that were there we were able to um help them get rooms for some of our singles and then also um for our families some of them came into capernaum place which is the picture below our transitional and that they're still living there a few of the families and then others got their apartment and we worked with the city of lawrence and also with dhcd so right now because of covid when we reopened we had to restructure the shelter and we were like we want to help the singles but who is the most vulnerable at the moment, right? And we, you know, came down to it that it's our the children, right? So now we are able to safely um, house five families. So families is the single mother and their children. And we can, you know, the mom can have, some moms will have five, six, seven kids. We have, thank God, we have a room that's big enough for that. And what we did, we created the five family suites so um prior to it be they would have to share bathrooms they shared um the living room and um but right now they have their own bathroom and they have their own living room and um when we opened up we we knew that especially lawrence that lawrence was one of the last communities to come out of the red zone we knew that it was gonna be most likely remote learning so we created this space for our children to be able to learn we got them laptops because if you i don't well if you remember in lawrence in the beginning they only gave out one laptop per family so you had two children or three children and there was one laptop so what we saw that need and we ended up providing more um more laptops the the lawrence public schools did then afterwards end up giving um more laptops per child and then what happened was those laptops the moms were able to stay with it whether they wanted to continue their education or any trainings um they were able to do that online as well so they were able to stay with those laptops so let's see so Okay, and then Capernaum Place, thank God. So Capernaum Place is a 20 unit um, building, apartment building. So that pretty much um, wasn't you know bothered because they have their own apartment. So they had their own space, they have their own bathrooms. They have, the only thing that um, did affect Capernaum Place COVID was that we ended up having to give extension. So ideally what we would like for Capernaum Place is a two year stay. Um, and we saw that we they were not able to move on because COVID just, everything just froze like with COVID. All right. Okay, we can move on. We also um, provide food and we have a food pantry and the food pantry opens up on Wednesdays and it's from nine to two. And we are seeing there is an increase um, of people that are coming. So on average right now, 
we're giving at about uh, for about a thousand families and for individuals is about a total of four thousand per week and we also see that in our soup kitchen that was our the largest um increase in the soup kitchen we're seeing upwards on you know the the heavy days is 400 and plus um people coming in and getting food and these are cooked meals we're doing like a to-go um we have a window and they're able to go up to the window and they're able to get their hot meals and it's a to-go um plate okay the let's see so we were able to keep the food pantry and the soup kitchen open throughout pandemic thank god and then as i mentioned there we were able to transform um the shelter and our thrift store so the thrift store uh was closed but then we opened it up last was it this year i think it was this year we opened it back up um we stayed with one we before we used to have three we stayed with one the one in south um lawrence and right there we're able to um provide the community um clothing um at a very discounted price and very good clothing as well um yeah and that's Lazarus house. I tried to go fast. You said 10 minutes. <laughs> so. That was great. Thank you, Carmen. No, thank you for, for that. And okay, and I share then the I'm sorry. One of the things I did want to share and I forgot was the calls that I continue to get is the housing I can, you know, I continue to get that it's such a need and it in my community, the rents have skyrocketed like two bedroom, three bedroom can go upwards up onto $2,000 where I believe, um, was it Sue that shared, like when someone is making minimum wage to pay a rent, you know, where ideally you're saying, you know, that you're supposed to get 30% of your income, you know, and then what we're seeing is that multiple families are going into an apartment um, if they get a three bedroom, you sometimes have three families into a three bed where we're still in a pandemic. Um, so we we get many phone calls. We were getting lots of phone calls because a lot of families um, that were on P PUA, the pandemic unemployment, they were not able then, if they found an apartment, um, the landlords knew that PUA was gonna stop eventually. So, right, so they were not able to get the apartments that way. And then when they would go to DHCD, they were saying you're making too much money. So we have families staying in hotels, like staying in hotels. And this was multiple calls, um, getting that like weekly. And then now it just continues with that now that it's getting colder, even though thank God this week it was a little warmer. Um, but we continuously get those calls. We get from singles, you know, we um, we refer them to different places that still take singles. And then um, a lot of families that are still displaced or staying at, you know, like they're spending all their money in a, in a hotel. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah. And I know it was also illustrated right before COVID. I think we placed, Carmen, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we placed our last family from the Columbia gas crisis, you know, three years later, which is wrong in so many ways. They were living in hotels um, uh, because of the reasons that, that Carmen spoke to. Um, okay, let's round things out with Russ. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, it's nice to meet everyone. My name is Russ Poulin. I am the Director of Family Services for Lynn Shelter Association. Um, and today I would like to talk a little bit about our shelter system, a little bit about COVID, and kind of some of the impacts that we're seeing as a result of um, what's been going on in the world. Um, so our mission, um, and we can go on to the next one, thank you. Um, Lynn Shelter, we believe everyone deserves a place to call home. It's really about giving people a safe environment where they can kind of pursue um, their own needs and goals in order to become self-sufficient over the long term. Um, we run a variety of different programs. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about some of those real quick next. Um, can you flip for me? 
Thank you. Um, so uh, Lynn Shelter, um, we run a whole bunch of different programs. Um, we're really excited about it. Um, we have um, struggled like everyone has kind of talked about over the course of this pandemic. Um, you know, providing the same services um, at the same uh, levels that we did kind of pre-pandemic. Um, there's been a lot of struggles and a lot of challenges. Um, we currently run an adult um, family or an adult homeless uh, shelter for individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, we serve uh, 40 plus individuals. During the COVID pandemic, we actually operated two um, additional sites uh, for overflow um, in the state of Massachusetts um, for individuals who um, were unable to be housed uh, in other locations um, because of what was going on. Um, at the same time, we offer our outreach services. Um, we have outreach workers who work with uh, individuals experiencing homelessness um, out on the street who are in the camps, um, who are kind of part of that um, population, which has really been struggling a lot with um, because of COVID concerns and fear of what um, could potentially happen um, with engaging in providers and kind of going into shelter. Um, you know, there's been some spikes over the, the last year of um, individuals uh, who are actively homeless um, and on the street um, versus um, those in shelter. So we saw a little decrease um, in our shelter and shelter prov uh, provisions um, and a little increase in the number of people experiencing homelessness who are out, um, out in the community. Um, one thing that we do do to try and help alleviate that, we operate 89 single occupancy rooms um, for uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, we make those referrals through our own agency um, and accept referrals from elsewhere. Um, you know, so it is it's still, you know, there are some shared spaces and as I'm sure everyone's aware with COVID that can be very challenging. Um, and we've done a lot to try and alleviate some of those concerns. Um, throughout our agency, not just at our individual shelters and sites, but also at our family sites. Um, another program we've been offering um, throughout the pandemic, though, again, on a, on a slightly different note, we've uh, become very adept, like many of us here have today, at um, <laughs> managing things over uh, Zoom and on other online forums. Um, it's, you know, certainly um, been challenging, um, but we do have a, a C-SPEC uh, program, which is for uh, chronically homeless um, individuals and families um, who also have a co-occurring um, concern of uh, a disability, whether that's a substance use diagnosis or whether it's related to um, a mental health concern. Um, so, you know, we work with housing these individuals um, and also um, ensuring that um, throughout the time that they are permanently housed, we are able to provide support. Um, so we also actually operate three family homeless shelters. We have a total of 64 rooms, um, which means at any given time, we probably have between 120 um, and close to 200 um, and change individuals um, in our shelters. Um, it's been really challenging through COVID, as I'm sure everyone can imagine. Um, we've had to make a lot of adjustments. Um, we've had to invest in a lot of uh, alternatives. I know um, that my counterpart, um, Carmen, uh, was talking about, um, you know, a lot of technology investments um, on their half, uh, you know, a lot of um, cleaning investments. Um, every time we have a positive COVID case, we bring in a, a team to sanitize our agency um, locations. Um, you know, I think like uh, the food banks and like, um, you know, Lazarus House, I think we're all experiencing a pretty significant spike in cost, um, you know, in making sure that our shelters um, and our programs are available to people, but in a way that's safe. Um, and, you know, we've all kind of taken different steps um, to kind of go about that. But, you know, the goal is always the same. We want to be able to provide these services and we want to be able to provide them um, to the best of our ability, um, given the enormous constraints that COVID has placed on um, everyone's resources. Um, having said that, we also offer enrichment programs, um, opportunities for our families to learn how to um, gain different skills or maybe engage in, a, in an activity with their children. Um, 
uh, to learn something to benefit them in the future, or maybe just to help um, kind of ease the uncertainty of being in shelter in, you know, the time of a pandemic um, where things are really challenging. I mean, shelter life is difficult to begin with. And then when you add a pandemic on top of that, um, you know, it really impacts people. We see a lot more um, kind of uh, family concerns. We see a lot more mental health concerns coming out. We see a lot more um, uh, of people kind of struggling with their day to day. Um, things that used to be easy, like, you know, getting your kids to school is no longer easy, um, you know, and trying to kind of work with families around that has been a real priority over the last uh, year and change. Um, we can jump to the next slide. <laughs> so just a couple of quick numbers in Massachusetts. Um, there's about 6,000 and change people who are experiencing homelessness um, and 11,000 people in families experiencing homelessness. This was just interesting to me because we rank uh, six uh, in total number of individuals in experiencing homelessness in the United States currently. Um, but we also rank somewhere around fifth depending on who you ask about most expensive places to live. So I'm sure as everyone um, is easy, you know, easily able to see, this is, is a huge issue. Um, and I know that um, Carmen alluded to this as well and had some conversation about how difficult it is now um, to place uh, our individuals and families experiencing homelessness into long-term stable opportunities given how difficult it is to live here. And even having a job these days, it's just not necessarily enough. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the funding that's first to go um, is the funding that helps people maintain long-term um, placements. Um, and so that's, I mean, it's a real thing out there. Um, can I have another slide? So I wanted to just talk uh, about a few things. Um, related to COVID-19. So in terms of housing, one of the things that we're seeing um, is a lot of difficulty um, getting families out into the community and a lot of it's cost related. We're not seeing the same amount of vouchers that um, have typically been released by DHCD and other uh, organizations. Um, there's a lot that are kind of in the pipelines, but maybe haven't been released yet. But then there was also a huge delay when COVID first started, where a lot of families kind of became stuck um, because a lot of uh, the moving pieces to all of these different opportunities just stopped as people tried to figure out what they were going to do about this new situation um, that kind of everyone was facing. Um, COVID actually also had a couple um, un unintended uh, impacts on the uh, the housing market as well. Um, and I know um, that somebody just spoke to this, but you know, the cost of living um, in this state and especially for apartments has skyrocketed um, you know, to the point where even if we can get families into the apartments without additional supplementation, um, even beyond what is currently available um, from a lot of sources, um, you know, families aren't able to maintain that. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that, you know, ends up being um, paid for in some cases by the agencies. Um, and it can be really tricky. Um, and so another issue we've been having is that um, landlords have become much more selective. Um, you know, part of the inventory issue is related to the more the eviction moratorium, um, you know, and one of the things we anticipated initially was that landlords may be more interested in um, opportunities for stable um, payments from various uh, state agencies, whether it's home based or whether it was a voucher based program. But what we're really actually seeing is because um, there's less inventory in the market landlords. Um, are actually having an opportunity to be really choosy um, around who they take in. And what we're seeing from that is people um, coming into um, or applying for housing and being turned down fairly regularly because of, um, um, you know, or, um, you know, minor criminal histories, which may have historically been overlooked, but, you know, landlords really aren't in a position where they have to worry about that anymore. Um, Schools, again, shift, schools have shifted to remote learning. Um, I know Carmen mentioned that. It's been really challenging. It's also challenging for the parents. Um, you know, it's harder for them to kind of 
go and better themselves or look at other opportunities because now they have a child home with them full time um, in a lot of cases that's just starting to clear out. So our families are all a little bit behind. Um, employers have started hiring again, but because schools and daycares are still a little bit unpredictable, um, you know, our families, again, getting stable long term employment is really taking a lot of effort or really taking a lot of advocate advocacy on their behalf. Um, work education or any of programs, again, for a long time, they just kind of stopped as everybody um, tried to figure out what was going on. Um, and, you know, now they're, they're opening again, but we're, again, we're seeing a lot less uh, availability. Um, we're also seeing in, impacts in mental health for our families and our individuals are, you know, not as readily accessible. Um, it's great that they can do some kind of telehealth um, and, you know, Zoom meetings, but the demand overall has really gone up across the board. So we don't necessarily have the resources available that we'd like to. Um, families are really struggling with um, kind of figuring out what's going on um, in terms of resource, the vaccine sources. I mean, you hop on social media, we've all seen the posts. <laughs> um, you know, they hit both ends of the, of the spectrum, polar opposites. Um, and our families are, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of uh, resources into helping educate people around that um, and helping them make good decisions for themselves and their children. Um, and then the, uh, the other piece, you know, that we've seen is the, the kids that we're working with are really struggling with their social and emotional development, especially those um, preschool slash new school age kids um, who aren't getting uh, the opportunities to integrate, integrate socially with uh, other children and their age. We've worked um, on creating as an agency several um, online opportunities for kids to interact and play together. Um, we have uh, had some, uh, we're working on a, a program potentially for some yoga um, for kids um, so that they can kind of have their wireless headphones and join this class via Zoom and participate and kind of hang out with their peers. Um, but, you know, again, it's been really challenging. And, you know, I think a lot of these things uh, are reflective in, um, across the board. And I think everybody's seeing um, different pieces of this um, and the impacts of this. So just want to say thank you to everybody um, for taking the time to uh, share with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope that everybody found something that was helpful to them. And uh, my information is on the screen. So if anybody wants to reach out and ask questions or if you if I missed something that you'd love to follow up on, um, you know, like everyone, I'm sure today we'd, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. That was great. We've given you quite a bit of information, but you can see that, you know, the, the patterns are consistent across. You, we picked organizations across the county, different parts of the work, but um, there's repetition, right, in the patterns that we're seeing. So I'd love to open up questions. Uh, we have, we officially have about a half an hour, but we'll sort of use the time and space as questions come up. So I'll go ahead and go around the room. Lisa, Lisa Parker. Yes, to all four of you, first of all, thank you so much for sharing um, your experiences and what you're seeing. It's very informative for those of us who are on the funding side. Um, as a representative of the Women's Fund of Essex County, of course, um, we are specifically interested in sort of the impact you're seeing, especially on women and girls. Um, you were talking you know, obviously about the greater population. I'm curious uh, just to know a little bit more um, specific to what you're seeing either about women or girls uh, and if there's a greater uh, number of women and girls that might be either homeless or experiencing food insecurity, anything you could share from that lens would be very helpful for us. I'll jump in. I, I, I mean, I think that women uh, consistently take more of the brunt. Uh, if we see, and I heard it from, um, especially the folks from shelter, and I'm sure Lindsay sees it a lot, a lot of head of household are, it's, it's the woman who is the head of household. And so, um, you know, add, it was already stressful before a pandemic hit because that woman is responsible for the major amount of um, money that's coming into the household. And then also, making sure that those children are getting to school, 
they're fed, they're housed, the, the amount of responsibility on many women was already huge and large. And now add a pandemic and children are out of school. And for a little while at the beginning, gosh, where am I gonna get my food? Because you know, you know, they didn't know that Beverly Goods Jobs would still be open or that the schools would step in and make sure that there were meals available. And even though the meals were available, now, now you have to get there. It's a different access. So, you know, access is so critical. So instead of sending your kid to school and the school make sure that your child connects with food, you actually had to then seek out the place where the food was being served. So you had to, maybe you had to go to the high school instead of your local, um, your local school. And so for a, a lot of families, that was, you know, certainly challenging, but women, always, I mean, it's not exclusive, but women always are, are taking the brunt and, and they're really stressful, stressed out anyway, out of pandemic. And, and that's that mental health piece that we're seeing is, um, you know, we know families who, are, who come to us and come to any of, the, of my colleagues, they're already in trauma. If you're to the point where you need food and housing, you're already in trauma. And then add a pandemic on top, no wonder mental health is maybe the number one issue right. that we all talked about. I'd like to add something too. I think um, you covered it really well. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I would say in shelter, um, we're seeing a lot, um, a lot more domestic violence, and, um, uh, kind of uh, victims who are coming to shelter, um, you know, head of household. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic, um, and some for some families, you know, a lot more together. This is a good thing, but for others, not so much. Um, and so we are seeing a lot more of that. Um, seeing a lot more, um, you know, uh, situations where um, the mothers of primary caregivers are actually um, having to leave the home because of their burden, um, and ending up in shelter. Um, and I think you know um, that's. In some ways, I do think there's so much of these things between that. There's less mental health support. I think there's less um, opportunities um, for families to kind of be confessed to each other, which there's time families um, in terms of how to report domestic violence. That's certainly, you know, may have been previous incidents, but it's not the same on a significant situation. As you know, as you said, you know, a lot of the time, my mom is at the front of the primary uh, caretaking and of um, you know, managing the family in a lot of ways. And I think we're working on a good one for that two years. It's unfortunately. Uh, Russ, we're having some trouble hearing you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> you know, I think what one of the things, uh, the short version is, you know, I do think because of the pandemic and what's going on, we have been seeing a lot more from the households um, coming in with um, significant domestic violence um, or um, domestic violence um, in a family which may have kind of been existing on the borderline, but then where is now um, spending a lot more time um, in a small confined area with a few outlets. And so we're, we're just, we definitely seen a rise um, in terms of uh, the, the, the services we're needing to provide um, in the households. Um, to Real, real quickly before I move to John Payson, who has a question, and then Joan, Lisa, I'll also, um, I'll, I'll also say ECCF, we've been partnering with the state on a large initiative for, we're calling it economically disadvantaged, um, to distribute resources. We've done one, we're doing another. Um, and, um, you know, it's, for it's primarily for immigrant refugees and those in varying states of status. And they could use the resources for anything. We made sure that um, there was, you know, the, the resources were distributed in ways people could use them. Um, and it was allowable for food, medicine, transportation, technology, rent, um, an array of things. And over 80% of the resources were used for housing and 80% mm -hmm. went to female-led households. Um, was not a huge surprise, but it was just very interesting, particularly in the immigrant yeah. refugee and um, those in varying levels of, of uh, status. 
Um, but we have various, and that was across the county. Yeah, all right, thanks. So, um, John Payson had the next question and then Joan Brooks. Sure, I'll uh, go quickly. Uh, thanks to all of you for the presentations. Some of my favorite, organi all my favorite organizations are on here, um, funders too, so uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess two things. One is because mental health has come up over and over again, there's a community health benefits survey going around for Beth Israel Health System. Uh, I think the Community Foundation has a link if you need it. You can also get it from Beverly Hospital. And the more people who weigh in on this, the more likely we are to get grants in the county uh, in their service area. And the other hospitals have the same thing uh, to go to nonprofits that are doing work in that area. Um, Sort of related to that, uh, my question for the presenters is that, you know, the pandemic seems to be evolving into a sort of endemic problem. In other words, COVID is going to be around at some level forever going forward. And so the um, uh, organizations have all shifted uh, enormously uh, in the last year and a half in order to meet the pandemic. But now we sort of have to turn to the, you know, post-pandemic phase, even if it's endemic uh, COVID-19. So I wondered two, two pieces to it. One, have you, have you found any hidden benefits of having to go through that dislocation and reinvention? Uh, for, I, I think about, for example, telehealth, which is potentially a really huge benefit, maybe especially even for uh, behavioral health. Um, for some people in the community who don't have transportation and uh, have jobs, et cetera. Uh, but are there, is that, or are there other hidden benefits you've found that we need to raise up so that others can uh, think about them and use them? Um, and uh, what's the biggest thing that you see thinking radically about this next phase? You know, what, what's gonna change in a way that an organization like Lazarus House or Bootstraps or whatever isn't going back to normal the way we used to know the organization, but it's going to be the new, new thing we hear about from you. Lindsay, do you want to go? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think uh, COVID certainly did bring some, some opportunities to work creatively uh, and, and moving in the in the food distribution space to this curbside online shopping piece. Uh, in, our, in our weekly dinner, for example, we had been seeing you know, an underutilization of, from families. I mean, over the years, we just knew a dinner on four to, from four to six on a Wednesday night, I have small children. There's no way, <laughs> no matter how desperate I am that I'm making that, I'm making that meal. Uh, and so, we had actually been talking about how could we possibly do some sort of takeout, but the configuration of our program space really prohibited that uh, from, from us being able to do a takeout and a sit down dinner at the same time. And, uh, but when we shifted to a takeout model, I, I mean, it quadrupled the number of families, I mean, in days who are coming and continue to come. Uh, it also allowed organizations like early intervention to be able to come and pick up family sized meals to bring to their clients. Uh, and so it really opened the doors. And, and I, I sometimes like to brag that our neighbor's table is probably the most efficient way to get your groceries on the planet today. You place your order today, you pick your location and appointment time for tomorrow. You pull into your parking spot at you, in your 15 minute window and within five minutes, you're greeted by the loveliest uh, community member, and then your groceries are in your trunk and you're on your way. And so the survey that we did, um, you know, we had 500 households participate in a guest satisfaction survey this spring. And you know they said that they were able to find times, so it's, it's available five days a week in multiple locations, so they could find the times, they were still able to get the quantity and quality of food that they needed. Um, we do have about 20% of our households who cannot order online, so we use a phone system. Uh, we, have a, we had to upgrade our phone technology so that our volunteers could take phone orders from their living room uh, because we don't have the space for them to come into our office. So when we continue, when we asked those households what they wanted going forward, um, you know, almost a third of them said they wanted curbside specifically. 
Uh, so it was like about 27% said they wanted to continue curbside. Uh, and maybe about 37% said they wanted a choice. They wanted to be able to come in and shop or um, pick it up, you know, a, a, an online order instead. So that is definitely something we will never put away, um, which then means that our organization has to function differently, which means we have to sustain the capacity to maintain a live inventory system every product so that when you order two half gallons of orange juice, your cart has two half gallons of orange juice, not one, not one apple, you know. Uh, and so uh, it's a very different logistical operation for us. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned in my presentation that will really change the way we move forward we knew right before COVID, we had done an internal analysis and we knew we needed our next phase of growth. We had opened our, the facility we're in now um, back in 2016 and projected growth out to 2020, uh, which we met and exceeded in 2018. Um, and so we knew we were looking at our next phase of growth. And during the pandemic, as we were reaching out to our peers within our Seacoast Food Provider Network, most of them are all volunteer. You know, they they reflect what our neighbor's table was 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, they were desperate for infrastructure. And so as a board, we, we, um, we really made the decision that whatever our next phase of growth and scaling would be, would be leveraged on behalf of our entire Seacoast Food Provider Network. Um, one of the biggest barriers for those smaller operations uh, to be able to do more was, uh, you know, uh, the lack of, of enough food, but a barrier to getting more food was the lack of storage to be able to take it when and where it was available um, or trucks or able body, body volunteers. Uh, so we are partnering actually beyond just our immediate 12 communities uh, with, we're, we're reaching out and we are actively partnering with our peers in uh, the city of Haverhill, uh, and Lawrence to look at how this infrastructure really serves the entire region. We need, we need that proper infrastructure behind the scenes. This can't be ad hoc piece it together. Um, never once at our neighbor's table after March 31st, did you ever see a line of people outside our door? Didn't mean that we weren't serving hundreds and hundreds of people um, on a daily basis, but we found a way to make it efficient and predictable and reliable for them uh, so they didn't have to spend three hours waiting for maybe an, you know, half empty bag of groceries. So uh, it's being able to make sure that no matter where, if you're coming to our central market in Amesbury or you're accessing one of our peers in Newberry or Rowley, you, you have the same consistency and reliability. So I think that collective approach, and I can speak to, you know, the networks that we're working with in Haverhill and Lawrence that, you know, there is a um, groundswell, I know the group uh, Groundwork Lawrence got uh, the, the food systems grant um, uh, earlier this year or last year, I've lost time, <laughs> time reference, uh, to be able to do some of the mapping that we've done in our region. So, so we're working you know, collaboratively with them. So I think you're gonna see a lot more of that. Great, thank you, Lindsay. Um, hold uh, just one moment, I wanna make sure Joan, your question, you've been raising your hand. Yeah, hi, I was just wanting to ask about, since uh, so much has been said about housing and that being a problem and, and particularly about apartments and what's being done to remedy that both short term and then longer term. Yeah, um, I'll take the first piece of that. <laughs> um, so I think, and actually, I think this also goes to John's question a little bit as well. Um, I think that for shelter systems in general, um, we, we kind of are looking at, um, I know you talked, John, about, well, I know you talked, John, about um, the endemic. Um, and I think for the shelter systems, unfortunately, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, you know, a lot of the upcoming things and things that are going on are related to um, you know, 
this eviction retarding or ending or having ended, um, you know, enhanced unemployment benefits, uh, you know, additional money is going away. Um, so I think other than contract with some other um, agencies can, um, this may be effective. I think we're just starting to see the beginning of our um, next phase. Um, but our next phase, I think, is still going to be very challenging. And it's still likely going to look um, like a lot of people needing services. Um, having said that, you know, due to getting vouchers out again, that's helpful. Um, I think, um, you know, seeing the housing market rise a little bit um, as we reach that endemic um, will also be helpful. Um, but ultimately, what we really need is just more affordable units um, or more ways to subsidize units for families directly who are going into these departments um, to kind of assist them with getting to where they need to be. Um, and I think, you know, those are the things we're really looking for. And um, unfortunately, a lot of, um, you know, the grants and so forth that the state has available are earmarked for very specific things. Um, and those specific things don't really include assisting with um, additional rent assistance over um, what somebody may be receiving. So it's it's one of those things where it's going to take a little bit of macro action um, and, uh, you know, seeing where we go next in terms of um, what the homeless situation looks like um, now that a lot of these enhanced benefits are kind of going to be unavailable. Great. Thanks, Russ. I'm curious to hear from um... Sue and, and Carmen, but Carmen, why don't you jump in, share some of your thoughts, because I yeah. know you're kind of squarely in that space, and then we'll jump to Sue. Yeah, when we talk about the housing, it's so sad because here in Lawrence, you can be on the wait list for about 12 years. So it's like when we have, yeah, when we have, for instance, that other money that comes in, like through the HCD, the home base, they can cover maybe some programs, it depends how it comes in, they can cover for like a year, and then some other, like, but then some is just um, first, last and deposit, and then that's it. And then that's where, you know, how there is such a shortage of apartments. That's why landlords are like able now to be picky. And the other thing is just because I'm in the community, I know of many landlords, uh, including myself, that, that when they did accept home base, that's all they received was the home base. And then some, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the the people that were there, then they had to get, um, you know, go go, you know, get kicked out of their their housing because that's all they paid was what DHCD gave them. So a lot of the landlords in my community, like they look at home base and they 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 don't want to try with it. So, um, well, we we just closed out um, and thank God it got approved through our board uh, that we tried. For nine months, we worked on it on a strategic plan. And one of the things is continuing to um, see how many more families we can serve, like so expanding. We know it's just like a little drop, right? In 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 an ocean, like a problem that's like an ocean. And sometimes we do, we feel that it's like, wow. But even if it's a additional three families, if it's helping out at least 20 singles in my community, it's at least a drop, you know, in, in that to the solution but yes it's it's a continuing problem and then um there's lots of talks about in the local politics about we have a new mayor or that it's going to be starting um and we'll see because there's talks about like a rent control as well so yeah thanks carmen thank sue you. what about you well i i just you know first of all i want to really thank our shelter folks because we get people who come through our door and we need to try to place them in shelter. And um, we're many times not successful, but I am so appreciative for the work that they do because if you have someone in crisis, it's huge. But to sort of talk to the more systemic or larger picture, because I think um, maybe that was um, the point of the question a little bit. Um, I think housing of any sort that is being built in our region is good. Market rate is good, affordable is better but any housing that's being built is a good thing um, or coming online to be available is a good thing because right now it's, it's supply and demand. We don't have enough housing for the demand in this region. So then what happens is something that used to be affordable becomes unaffordable um, because it can be, right? So it's, it's a huge, huge supply issue. 
Um, there are some really, really great partners working on affordable housing, and that's a great thing. But if you're in a community that is considering any sort of development, um, as long as it, you know, as long as it's not crazy, I, I, I would recommend that you support it because people want to live here, and um, and and it's trickling down, and that's why we're having such an issue. Um, I think I think we have just a minute or two, and I wanted to just sort of jump back over to John's question a little bit and talk a little bit about Beverly Bootstraps. Um, I will say housing is a conversation we have here all the time. And one of the things that we're thinking about is, you know, we tend to do housing stability sort of one month's rent at a time for somebody for during the year. And we're really talking about is that model, does that make sense anymore? And so really, really trying to figure out, could we fund more so that um, some, if we could get them into a place that we could um, really keep them secure for a lot longer than a month. Um, that's one of the things that, that we're looking at and, and our case management sort of changing into a really, really involved model. Um, we, we do, things are sort of a little more discreet than really relational. Um, and we'd like to make that um, more of a long-term relationship with folks. Um, and our, you know, our college and career readiness, um, what we're finding is, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. We have a guy, um, a young family, we can see they could be, a candidate for self-sufficiency. He's in a plumbing program. But in order to make all of this work, we had to support their housing for a little while because they had to not work as much in order to get him through this program that in the long run is going to pay off. But the short term was, it was crazy what we had to do to get him into and through this, this program. So that middle support um, to help people switch a career is, is huge. Um, and then what did we learn? We learned things like um, tax preparation is really lucrative uh, for our folks, you know, with all the credits that are coming down through the government and we don't see that going away. Getting those tax um, preparation, those taxes in for folks is huge. Um, I mentioned virtual learning, some pros and cons, but it won't go away. It's absolutely here to stay. And our seasonal distribution, Lindsay was talking about distribution and how you do it differently. Really, really interesting that parking lot. Hey, we'll grab your gifts out. We'll put your gifts in. I don't see that going away for us. It's really efficient for everybody. Um, so yeah, a lot of things learned through this pandemic for sure. Um, and I thank everybody today for, for your time and attention and interest. And we have all of our contacts and um, we all are very um, willing to talk to any of you if you have further questions. That's great. I spoke, thank you. I spoke for my colleagues, but I, I know them all. They're all good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And Steve, I see you have one question. Um, if, if it's a very short question, just because we have about one minute before we need to wrap up. Well, uh, gee whiz, we talk about people, place, and purpose. And I'm seeing some amazing projects involving our youth. And I'd love to have a long question about that. Um, but uh, these guys know where I live, but we're doing some interesting things, working with youth that, if you will, are grounded in the problem, but turning them into the solution, uh, making them part of the machine uh, that you all are working with. It can both provide you with resources and, and also that people place some purpose for the kids. So it's just a quick thought. We could spend an hour on it, but um, if someone's moved to follow the conversation, uh, Carol and everyone knows who I am and how to get a hold of me. Yeah. Well, Steve, we should certainly connect. We at the foundation have a new reinvigorated next gen initiative, which there's a big piece of it. That's exactly that. So we should touch base. Perfect. Um, uh, but I want to thank you all. You know, we try to stay on time with these. These conversations can clearly go on for hours and hours. Um, you know, we always have this moment where we say, are there going to be are there going to be enough questions to have the conversation? And I always come back reaffirmed with the vibrancy um, of the opportunity to authentically connect. So um, I wanna make a specific shout out to each of our four speakers for carving out this time. You're all doing such important work and this is a lot of time for you to carve out of your day. Um, please know that this group and ECCF continue to make sure that we're really listening authentically to try to shift things systemically and then individually. Um, Megan and I will be sending out a five things we learned as well as the recording, all of the amazing decks 
as well as the links. Um, and we hope to continue the conversation. I'll also share some highlights of what's happening at ECCF, one of which is a large partnership with CDBG that'll be focused on food insecurity that ECCF will be announcing soon. And in addition to that, our behavioral health systems approach partnership grants will be launched this week as well. So stay tuned, we have some big initiatives coming down the line. So with that, thank you very much. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you guys. Thanks, Karen. Karen, it's always so nice to see your awesome headshot. I don't know if she can hear us. So that was excellent. Let me stop the recording. Yeah. Sorry, I had a booster shot last night, so I'm laying in bed. Oh, no. <laughs> so that's why I'm not talking, but I'm, oh, I'm taking it. No again. worries. <laughs>